Geologists are commonly required to interpret the subsurface and illustrate these interpretations on cross sections. A series of techniques have been developed over the decades to assist in these endeavours, and in this short presentation, we'll look at area balancing with a view to establish the depth of detachment of a series of folds. So we can set up the problem here. So commonly we'll know the surface geology, we can map it, uh, recognize the orientation and distribution of rocks at the Earth's surface. So we know the outcrop, and our challenge then is to predict how these structures we see at the outcrop go down below into the subsurface. We're gonna look at how we can use concepts of cross-section balancing and develop these into the idea of area balancing. So let's set the scene by looking at what we mean by section balancing. So here we have some strata. They are originally constant thickness in this particular demonstration, uh, one on top of the other from A oldest up to E the youngest. And I've put a couple of markers across this profile, uh, one on the left X and one on the right Y. So this is our pre-deformation state of the strata. And after deformation, these rocks have become contracted so that our marker Y has moved in from the right to Y prime, representing the contraction experienced by all these layers. And the key point is that all these layers have experienced the same horizontal contraction. In other words, Y prime has remained normal to the layering and has moved in so that it remains parallel to X. X and Y have moved together rather like the jaws of a vice. So the contraction is equal in all layers. And this deformation has happened above a basal decoupling surface or detachment. Well, let's just consider the lower part of this diagram, where we have layer A and layer B. And layer B has deformed into this set of concentric fold structures. By that, I mean the layer has retained thickness during folding. Let's now plot on the position of the interface between layers A and B before deformation. So the regional is where the base of layer B would be without folding. You'll see that layer B, because it's been deformed by buckles, has moved exclusively upwards away from its regional. And in doing so, we can recognize where unit A has come up above the regional, defining a series of excess areas. Let's set up the significance of this. This excess area is equal to a missing area. The area has been consumed by moving Y in from the side during the contraction. So how is the missing area defined? Well, it's equal to the contraction experienced by the layers multiplied by a distance from the regional down to the detachment. In other words, it's a depth of detachment below layer B. So that's our contraction. How do we estimate this? Well, we can measure the present day length of the cross section, the horizontal distance between X and Y prime across our model. And the original length of our layer B can be established by measuring its sinuous bed length around all those folds and laying that length out flat. So the difference between the original length and the present length is the contraction. So we can find this by a simple measurement from the cross section. And because we can measure from the cross section the excess area, we can calculate the depth of detachment. So if we take the excess areas and divide them by that measurement of the contraction, we can calculate the depth of detachment for those folds. Well, this was recognized by Chamberlain back in the early part of the 20th century. So let's apply this understanding to a cross section that also comes in the early part of the 20th century to the Jura Hills in Switzerland. This is the surface geology as reconstructed by August Buchstorf in 1916. And the challenge is to interpret the subsurface. Here is Buchstorf's complete cross section. And you can see we've got folded strata, chiefly on here of Jurassic age, those blue rocks, overlying a basal detachment 
along the top of the yellow horizon, which is a basal unit of Triassic age, which in turn overlies basement. So let's apply the approach developed by Chamberlain to these folds. We'll just consider some of these folds and we need to complete a little bit that's been eroded away. So we can estimate the full shape of this layer of Jurassic strata. Right, well, let's apply our analysis. Can we find the detachment beneath this folded layer of Jurassic rocks? So we need to explain over what extent we're making our analysis. So we set up these two points at either end of our cross section. So we need to set up the regional. I'm going to construct the regional on the base of this blue formation here. And I've done this by joining up more or less the base of the sin forms in the cross section to make a relatively smooth uh, trajectory for our regional. And this represents um, our interpretation of the elevation and orientation of this uh, base of the blue formation before folding. Now, let's identify the excess area here of rocks that underlie this uh, blue formation and have been pulled up above the regional through the folding process. So now we need to estimate the cross-sectional area. And if we do this, it works out at four square kilometers. So this is the excess area. Next, we now have to est estimate the contraction experienced by the blue formation. So we have to measure around those folds sinuously. Notice the layer is more or less um, constant thickness around all those fold structures. In other words, it's deformed by concentric folding. So we unravel the layer and we find that it extends out for a further seven and a half kilometers uh, beyond the pins that we put in already. So there's seven and a half kilometers of contraction when we measure sinuously around the bed length there. So now we just need to divide our excess area, that's four square kilometers, by the contraction seven and a half kilometers to define the depth to detachment. And that value to the nearest five meters is 335 meters. So our depth to detachment below the region on the base of this blue Jurassic formation is estimated at 535 meters. Well, let's compare this now with Buxdorf's depth to detachment on his cross section. So here is his basal Triassic unit. It's a pretty good fit. Let's mix away and show his cross section and then the whole thing fully colored in. So the method looks pretty neat at interpreting the depth of attachments. In other words, how deep these folds penetrate down into the crust below the surface expression that we see at outcrop. So this is the classical method of area balancing. It's called area balancing because of this idea that the excess area matches or balances with the missing area that's been consumed by the deformation as the strata have been pushed together in the jaws of a vice. And as we develop this idea, it's relied on the notion that we can measure the amount of contraction experienced by the layers because there's a formation in this that we can measure sinuously its bed length and lay it out flat to determine the original length of that layer. The amount of contraction simply being the difference between this original length and the present length of the bed, the straight line distance measured in the cross section. And this is straightforward if the folding is concentric. So we have to assume that the bed length is conserved during the deformation. We also have to assume that the layer thickness was constant. In this case, layer A in our cartoon below was constant originally across the area through which the deformation is occurring. In other words, it's a layer cake stratigraphy. When we look at um, Buxdorf's cross section at the top, in his interpretation, some of the uh, geological layers in there do not retain uh, thickness around those folds. So can we generate a more generalized model for area balancing. We can start off by having this little experiment in here where we see three layers, green, yellow, and orange. 
So here's a bit of deformation. We've pushed in from the side. Again, the section balances because all layers have experienced the same horizontal contraction. But you can see that there's a distortion applied to the layering. Some of those square shapes are distorting into rectangles. Let's increase the deformation. So more contraction, and we developed a fold structure in there where the bed thickness is not conserved during the deformation. And if the thickness is not conserved, neither too is the bed length. So the deformation has changed the layer thicknesses and therefore the folding is not concentric. So let's move our story on to the later part of the 20th century when a general method for area balancing was developed by Rick Groschon and Jean-Luc Epard. So here we have uh, three geological layers, X, Y, and Z. If we look at the excess area beneath X, it's that shaded area, and it equals the missing area on the right-hand side of the diagram. The excess area defined as that patch there above regional for layer X. Again, the missing area is defined by the contraction multiplied by the depth of attachment. And of course, we can do the same with the other layers. So here it is for Y, and here it is for Z. So each of our three layers have their own excess areas. So although the horizontal contraction is constant for all the layers, the depth of attachment varies for each one, X being further away from the detachment than Y than Z. What we can do now is cross plot the excess area for each formation together with its height above the detachment. Although the diagram at the top is unscaled, in practice, the excess area, again, will be calculated in square kilometers, the height above the detachment in kilometers. So here we have the excess area for layer X. And the height of X is regional above the detachment. And we've cross plotted them on our graph. Let's do the same now for Y. And finally, Z. So there we have three points on our graph. If we join these up, we define a linear relationship. So there's a linear relationship between the excess area measured for each bed and its height above the detachment. And when the excess area hits zero, we are at the detachment level. In other words, we don't need to measure layer length and its contraction in order to estimate the detachment level, provided we've got multiple horizons that we can do these calculations on. So we need multiple layers. So let's go to a case now, which is a more realistic situation where we don't know the detachment level, but we know the shapes of three horizons, X, Y, and Z. First of all, we set up a reference level and the easiest place to do this is above the structure. But this is an arbitrary choice. And we're going to set this up now with excess area versus distance below the reference height. And we'll set reference height over there on the right hand side. And we're going to plot the negative distance away from this reference height. In other words, our data are going to plot to the left of R on our graph. As we're going to set it up on here, I'm going to make measurements from our reference level down to the crest of the structure. And we can do this if the strain is uniform for the layers within the structure itself. Otherwise, you want to measure from the reference level down to each horizon's regional. In either case, we cross plot our distances measured from the reference level against the excess area for those particular horizons. OK, so let's get going. This is the distance down to bed X. And there's the excess area for bed X measured in. Do the same for Y. Again, a further distance down below the reference level, a reduced excess area compared to X. And again for Z. Further down below R, a reduced excess area for bed Z. And again, these are plotting on a straight line. 
So simply join these up and extrapolate to where that line intersects excess area equals zero. And that defines along the horizontal axis there, the distance below R to the detachment. We can take this back to our cross section, measure down from R, taking that distance, and that is the detachment level. So this is the uh, Groschon and Epard method. It's really useful. We do not have to assume bed length conservation, so we can use this method generally when rocks have experienced layer parallel shortening. The method, of course, assumes plane strain, that all the actions happening in the plane of the cross section, and in this particular demonstration, that the stratigraphy started off as parallel bedded, in other words, layer cake, before deformation. There's a fundamental part to this method, which is being able to define the excess area, and that in turn is critically dependent upon the choice of regional. So for this particular type of box fold, where we have an isolated antiform separated by flat base adjacent synclinal areas, then the regional is simply the join up along the flat bases of these adjacent synclines. For bookstore section in the Jura, I've tied in the base of the synclines. And my regional is slightly arcuate and inclined in this particular case. Remember, the key point about the regional is it's a definition of where this layer was before the folding occurred. And this is fundamentally unknown and is an assumption that we have to make. It represents a critical uncertainty. So if you're worried about it, the best thing to do is to explore alternatives for different levels of regional and explore what that means in terms of detachment levels. So that's a brief introduction to the Groschon and Epard method. These concepts of area balancing with a view to understand and forecast the depth of detachment are really useful and important for understanding how far folds penetrate into the subsurface. These methods are powerful tools to assist in the interpretation of the subsurface.